This is the time of day where we begin our live grand rounds series, what I call the surgical bullpen. And I am, fortunately, you're not having to watch this part of the <laughs> program where I have to set up all the live streams and I'm not good at that. I have to, and there's a delay. Um, so good morning. My name is Dr. Anna Toker, your friendly neighborhood colorectal surgeon. And every Thursday morning, we do a little educational series. I wonder sometimes if I could not set this up for CME credit. Lord knows I put enough into it. <laughs> so good morning. Um, this morning's conversation is going to be because it's March, it's colon cancer awareness month. And so I thought we, we need to have at least one educational series on kind of like the bad part of colon cancer, which is you've got the disease. So we've talked earlier in the month about colon cancer screening. Um, and uh, so now what happens if that colon cancer screening re reveals that you have cancer? Um, this video, like the other Thursday morning videos, is sponsored content. Um, and our sponsor is a company called Super Patch, and I'll talk about them at the end. I like to give all the educational stuff up front before I talk about how I integrate their product into my own practice. So hopefully you learned something. One of the alarming things about colon cancer is that the incidence seems to be increasing as time goes on. Um, and seems to be getting in younger and younger patients. I can remember when I started my practice 20 years ago, um, the screening age was 50, but a lot of us thought the screening age should have been maybe 40. Now, within the last few years, we've dropped that age to 45. And now I'm wondering if it shouldn't be 35. Honestly, we've seen some young patients getting cancer. That is an observable documented fact, and we, we're not 100% sure why. One assumes it's going to be our environment. And if you followed my channel at all, you know, I think it has something to do with our um, diet. In particular, the way that food is grown, the way that food is manufactured or processed. There's something about that that's not good for humans. Um, and so anyway, and one of these things that is an issue is, is is colon cancer seems to be happening. So today in our little video, we're going to talk about um, what the stages of colon cancer, the types of surgeries that we do, a little bit on chemotherapy, and then some on the dietary things that I like to do before and after surgery. Um, that way, our focus in life does not necessarily have to be the doom and gloom that you've got cancer. I personally have had cancer in my lifetime, not colon cancer, but it is scary to get a diagnosis of a malignancy um, when you're not 100% sure what's going on. And um, part of my role is to encourage people that colon cancer is a survivable disease for many, many, many people, especially if it's caught early. It's one of the reasons I started with colon cancer screening earlier in the month, because um, the earlier you um, diagnose colon cancer, the more survivable it is. So, I, you know, some of this is going to be kind of sciencey. I hope y'all aren't offended. <laughs> some people, some of y'all are nerds. Tune in, nerds. Yeah, we're talking gut stuff, right? Um, so the stages of, oh, and let me, one more thing. Um, these PDF slides will go up on our website at dranatoker.com. That's a little button at the bottom of the screen. Um, that way, if you want to flip through the slides at your own, feel, knock yourself out. I do record this audio wise and without editing, I put it on Spotify. So the people listening on Spotify might want to go to my website, dranatoker.com find the free download area. And so all of my little lectures, I'll include my little slides. One of the people watching suggested I do slides. So there's my first two Thursday morning bullpens. I need to sort of retread. And we'll do that again, probably in the next month or two. And you'll think, 
she's run out of ideas already in four weeks, really. It's just because I want to have a live version with the slides. That way, um, you know, everyone is on board. Okay, the stages of colon cancer real quickly, right? So colon cancer is a spectrum of diseases ranging from not yet cancer to, oh my gosh, you have a serious life-threatening problem. Um, and our goal in life is to ca capture things earlier on in the process. Stages zero through one is we're talking about limited to the lining of the colon or, or simply in a polyp. And there is a role for these very early cancers to be removed with endoscopy. If it's a rectal tumor, we tend to do something called a transanal excision of that. It allows us to take care of extremely low rectal cancers without having to do major abdominal surgery. There's no colostomies involved in this. There's no chemo involved in this. You do have to be very cautious that it truly is a stage zero or a stage one tumor. And some stage ones still require a major surgery. It just kind of depends on where it is, the orientation of the polyp, the size of the polyp whether or not it's on a little stalk. Some polyps look like lollipops. So if you can catch a real long stalk with one of these very early cancers, colonoscopy alone is all that's required. And so um, one of the reasons to have your, someone asked me this, and this is a good question. Why go to a colorectal surgeon for my colonoscopy? Don't gastroenterologists do that? Yes, they do. But the second they get this cancer diagnosis, they're going to ship you over to a colorectal surgeon. So sometimes to skip a step, you know, come visit us. We're friendly. We tell jokes. We have better personalities. I mean, you know, it's a little bit of a bias this early in the morning. All right. Stage two, colon cancer involves the wall of the colon, but doesn't perforate through the wall of the colon. And this, this picture kind of shows us, I don't know if y'all can see my little marker here. I guess you can. Um, where this little tumor is getting right smidgy out, but not quite through it. And so colonoscopy alone is not adequate for this, right? You have to be able to remove the entire tumor. And so you gotta, you gotta do surgery. The other issue is Patients with these stage two cancers do have a high incidence of actually being stage three, meaning it's in a lymph node, right? So once the tumor gets into lymph nodes, you're no longer in a stage two category. So I should be more specific. This is a T2, or the tumor staging is two. The lymph node staging, we don't know. So when the tumor stage is almost through the colon, incidence of having a positive lymph node can be quite high. So you have to have an actual surgery. Okay. You've got to capture those lymph nodes to know why, because patients who have lymph node involvement have to have chemotherapy. Patients without lymph node involvement do not always need chemotherapy, although sometimes they do, depending on what the stuff looks like under the microscope, how young you are. If you're 35, 40 years old and you have a stage two cancer, they are very likely to offer you chemotherapy. I don't do chemotherapy. I'm not an oncologist. I'm a colorectal surgeon, but I'm telling you if an oncologist looks at you and says, Hey, because of your age and the aggressiveness of this tumor, you should have chemotherapy. Listen to that doctor. And I, I will encourage you in just a moment, how not to fear um, the chemotherapy. Sometimes it is required. And so a stage two cancer may or may not need chemotherapy, depending on the age of the patient um, and what this, the pathology looks like under the microscope. Now, a T3, a stage three cancer, if someone actually has positive lymph nodes, um, so when I say through the wall of the colon, that's, I'm trying to be uh, less confusing with my orientation, right? So doctors, when we stage things, there's a difference between the tumor stage, what we call a T stage, a T stage three is through the wall of the colon. And then an overall staging for the cancer is going to involve lymph nodes. All right. And so that's what I'm talking to you, the general population. When you're told you have a stage three tumor, 
what we're talking about is that there are lymph nodes that have cancer in them. And this type of surgery, if we know ahead of time that you've got lymph nodes present, you're going to require a surgery. If we do any kind of testing that suggests the tumor itself is a T3 stage, the tumor itself is through the wall of the colon, you're gonna need a full resection. These patients get chemotherapy. If you have a rectal tumor, and this is where people get scared about colon cancer because rectal cancer is so hard to treat. If you have a rectal cancer that on the preoperative staging, so the CT scans, the MRIs, show lymph nodes around the rectum, we're going to wind up doing treatment before the surgery in most instances. And the reason being the rectum is an enclosed little space is very difficult to get margins around that space. Um, you, when you take out a cancer, you got to get all of it. Even one little cell surviving. And I've seen this where someone comes in 18 years later after some form of cancer and they've got like one little segment of cancer. How did that get there? It's not anywhere else. And one could only surmise one cell survived, dropped into the pelvis, wherever, and, and now has become a tumor in its own right. So, so you want to make sure to the best of human capabilities, you can get all the way around the lesion, get all the way on the outside of the normal pathway spread of that cancer. And, and sometimes it's easier to do that in the pelvis if we pre-shrink things with chemotherapy and sometimes even radiation. Um, and I said, now I'm using scary words. It's so early in the morning. <laughs> You need to watch this later in the day so you don't get scared. That's I'm, I don't take offense. <laughs> okay, so stage four, that's scary. And, and it's interesting, we'll talk about this. This is one of the reasons people will be scared to have a colonoscopy because they're scared they already have stage four cancer. Um, stage four cancer means that we have pretty much spread to other organs of the body, not just lymph nodes. And again, chemotherapy is life saving in this instance. So when I see a patient with cancer and I feel like, okay, we need to do an operation based on the tumor and where it's located and the x-rays. If it is also spread to the lungs and the liver, I'm going to send the patient to an oncologist first. They're likely to get chemotherapy or even radiation if it's a rectal cancer first. Those patients wind up going to the operating room and I'll put in an IV under the skin for their pre-surgical treatment, what we call neoadjuvant therapy. If they have an obstruction and the presence of metastatic cancer, then I personally advocate for something called the colonic stent. It opens the colon from within the colon and not all doctors do this and I don't understand why. But from a surgeon's standpoint, if you're partially blocked and I cannot feed you and you're malnutritioned, you may need either that area removed, bypassed, or stented. That way you can eat again. This doesn't cure the cancer. It allows you to eat and regain your nutrition. And this way, chemotherapy melts that up, hopefully. And then uh, if you're responding well to chemotherapy and you've got strength about you, the oncologist will halt chemotherapy for about a month. Let me operate on you. And then six weeks later, you resume chemotherapy again. So stage four cancer is what scares people and with good reason. Um, it is, this is one of the reasons I would advocate, maybe not so much for a general surgeon when it comes to stage four cancer, unless you have no choice, um, because they're very quick to do a colostomy in this instance. And in my experience, people with stage four cancer in a colostomy almost never live long enough to close that colostomy. And so a lot of these patients, if they're trying to make end of life decisions, they would just assume not have to deal with the medical care of a colostomy. And so if I can do a stent, I will. Sometimes it's not possible. But it's always worth going to someone if you can, if it's not an emergency, that can sort of help you work through these decisions. You, 
for, for that. Now, chemotherapy, I, you know, I'm not, I can't speak much to this because it's not what I do for a living. Um, other than my experience of watching oncologists offer chemotherapy, they don't just give one, they're going to give a series of drugs and there's a bunch of different regimens and oncologists typically are running trials all the time. So these big oncology groups, um, there's a cancer registry, people go into the cancer registry. This is how we kind of can figure out, look, this pathology, this age, this stage, this is the cocktail that works best. You're right. And that way, when you walk in the door, you're not walking in as an individual patient at that moment. They kind of already have done some population studies. Yes, they will follow you closely to see if you're behaving like the rest of your population. Sometimes you will and sometimes you will not. There are some tests that will test specifically the tumor genetically to see what it will be sensitive to and what it will not be. So go to a big oncology group that has all of these capabilities. That's what I would suggest to you. And most of these oncologists are in big groups that collaborate in these national trials. So just for you, if you're going to an oncologist, you know, make sure they're using all of the technology to their, um, to their benefit and to your benefit. Um, typically this is going to involve IV type chemotherapies. Some of the chemotherapies are given as a continuous pump, which is kind of bizarre because you're going to have like an IV um, stuck in skin underneath here. And then you're wearing a fanny pack um, to the, uh, to like a little pump and in this, and it goes 24 seven. You'll do that for a couple of days a couple times a month. And in the way they, they coordinate that is very different. Sometimes there's an oral medication that they add to the cocktail. And I'm not the best person to talk about all this. It's just, these are the things I see patients come in for. They always require this IV. As a surgeon, I'm typically the one who puts in the IV. You might find yourself in an oncology group where the colorectal surgeon is in the oncology group. So in Texas, there's a group called Texas Oncology and they do hire their own colorectal surgeons. And so if you go to one of those guys, um, they might have an interventional radiologist who puts in your IV. We all do that pretty much the same way. You are sedated. It's done under x-ray guidance. We access, there's a large vein underneath this clavicle or even the vein in your neck. I know this all sounds very scary so early in the morning. It's buried under your skin. So really the only person who knows it's there is kind of you. It's like a pacemaker in that it's part of you. And it's designed to be there for a prolonged period of time. There's a risk to that. You can have bleeding, you can have infection. The lungs come all the way up to the apex of your shoulders. And so in some patients, you can inadvertently collapse a lung. I have put in thousands of these IVs. I've, I've never done that in my practice. I've never done that in my residency, have I? Maybe as an intern. Don't have an intern put in this IV. That's, that's pretty much what I'll say. However, what I tell all of my patients, if you struggle breathing within the few days after this IV, you have to let us know. It's probably not a good idea to get one of these IVs and get on an airplane because the compartmental changes will exacerbate your lung issue. Um, this type of IV in a medication doesn't cause your hair to fall out. Um, unlike breast cancer or ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer, where the chemo seems worse than the disease, this is not true in, in colon cancer cases. So it's one of the reasons why I'm like, look, do not decide not to do chemo because you saw uncle John with pancreatic cancer struggle with chemo. If you're making the wrong decision, if someone tells you you need chemo and you decide not to do it. Um, and I, I hate that for patients because I feel like they're not making an informed consent. They're making an emotional judgment. Um, that's less than accurate. Okay. One of the things that we will sometimes add to patients is radiation. And typically we reserve that for rectal cancers. Now I'm not talking about anal cancers. Anal cancers are very different. Um, I can briefly speak to that. As a general rule, anal cancers, we start with radiation before we do anything else because anal cancers are a very different pathology. 
Yes, they get the IV. Yes, they get chemotherapy. Yes, they get radiation. They may never, ever, ever need surgery. We pray they never need surgery. Rectal cancers that are adenocarcinomas are in a very different category where they almost always need surgery. It's a scary location because sometimes these tumors in this location require a colostomy. And, and, and sometimes a permanent colostomy, almost always a temporary colostomy. We've talked about it in the past. If you have a reconstructive surgery and your doctor has to do something called a, a diverting ileostomy, which we will do, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second, um, please don't fear that because that is, again, that's a temporary situation. The purpose of giving you radiation before surgery is to cure your cancer. Your number one objective here is to cure your cancer. We want to get negative margins when we do surgery and sometimes radiation allows us. I hate radiation before surgery as the surgeon performing the surgery because it makes my surgery difficult and it makes it difficult for the patients to heal. And my number one objective for patients is cure the cancer. And the second one is to get them to heal the surgery I just did. So that is kind of the situation. Um, sometimes they literally will do the radiation afterwards. So you'll do your preoperative testing, oftentimes an MRI or something like that. The radiate the tumor will look like mm, it's through the wall of the colon. None of the lymph nodes are enlarged. You go straight for surgery in that instance. You'll do the operation. A lymph node will pop positive. At that moment, the oncologist might choose to clean up that space with radiation just to make sure everything is sterilized for lack of better words. Okay. So now the types of surgery, and this is kind of more my wheelhouse. Um, it depends on where the tumor is located. So when we do surgery for colon cancer, we have to remove the tumor. We have to remove before and after the tumor, like the colon's a tube. Got to get space on either side, but more importantly, we have to get everything around the colon and we have to get the lymph nodes. And I tell people, just kind of imagine a, a pizza, you know, just imagine a pizza and the crust is the colon and the pepperoni are your lymph nodes, right? And the cheese is the mesentery, I, you know, for lack of better words, everyone knows what I'm talking about. So when we do a colon cancer surgery, we got to get a wedge and everyone freaks out. How much colon did you take out, doctor? No. Well, you know, by definition, I got to take out the tumor and I have to take out margins and have to take out some mesentery. What is more important than how much did I take out is how much did you leave? Okay. So when we're talking about cancer, we do, we take close to half your colon out that is required to get the lymph nodes, maybe 30%. It kind of depends on where it is. In some colon cancers, we're literally taking half the colon out. In some cancers will take maybe a third of the colon out. It depends on what is required to get all the lymph nodes out. Okay, so these are the words your doctors are going to use. A right colon resection. Left colon resection or left colectomy. There's something called a low anterior resection. And most low anterior resections tend to be done by colorectal surgeons the right colons and maybe even the left colons that involve splenic flexure, the general surgeons will still do um, some of those. You might have an oncology surgeon, someone who specializes in cancer. They do all of these surgeries, right? So that's a general surgeon with fellowship training on cancer. They're awesome surgeons, by the way. Um, there's something called an abdominal perineal resection. Um, this is the one that scares people. It leaves you with a permanent colostomy. And then there are these transanal excisions, and this is where your colorectal surgeon comes in, in play. And we can get up there pretty high with robotic instruments and something called a transanal minimally invasive surgery, um, which is almost like laparoscopic surgery through the hiney hall. You can do pretty decent surgeries with that, but you can't get the entire mesenteric chain that way, or at least... Um, without complications and to a good oncological effect. So if you have cancer, the transanal excisions typically are reserved for pretty early of the road 
malignancies, just so, just so you know. Okay, so those are the names that you might hear if you go to your cancer doctor. Okay, so what would be the complications after surgery? Well, like any colon resection. And in my hands, colon cancer and diverticulitis are the two diseases that are more likely to have a complication. The cancer patients being the most likely to have a complication. Now, why is that? Because they're malnutritioned. You have to do a huge operation. I mean, you got to get a lot of stuff, including taking all the blood flow. And blood flow is what allows people to heal. Nutrition allows you to heal, and the absence of radiation allows you to heal. So if you radiate a person who's malnutrition and have to do a wide resection, that person's going to be at a huge risk for a complication. So some of the things that we do to cancer patients are a little bit different because of that complication risk. Okay, what are the complications? And, and I know some of you are talking to cancer doctors right now. One hopes they're having this conversation with you, but I'll be honest with you. There are some patients who come to me where their doctors have told them nothing. Oh, you just need surgery and I'll see you next week. Okay, so what are the complications? Bleeding, the risk of bleeding, why? Well, any surgery can lead to bleeding. During an operation, um, pelvic surgery would be the most likely to cause extreme bleeding. Uh, complicated surgeries that are near the pancreas and the liver or the spleen, high risk for bleeding. Um, some, some cancers are literally right next to the spleen. You've got to consent the patient for possible splenectomy and pancreas surgery. Usually we know based on preoperative scheduling, if other organs have to come out in the pelvis, the organs that usually might have to come out might be the bladder, the prostate the uterus, the ovaries. If cancer is involved, you have to get all the way around these things. You don't want to break it up because then you'll spread cancer everywhere. Okay. That's called an in block resection. And anytime you do an in block resection, you're in weird planes um, from time to time and you can have bleeding um, infection, complicated surgeries, especially when you disrupt the blood flow can lead to infection. The anastomosis where we hook you back together if it does not heal because of lack of blood flow, which is typically why it would not heal, um, you'll get an infection there. So this is a known risk of surgery, especially if you have been radiated. You can get a bowel obstruction either immediately after surgery, although that's very uncommon, it can happen, um, or 20 years later. So anytime you've had abdominal surgery, you can form scar tissue that kinks and blocks the colon. You can get a hernia. Any operation will cause a hernia. You can have medical complications, lung failure, heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure. You can have damage and injuries to collateral organs, again, because we're doing these wide resections. This is all scary, which is why patients don't want to hear that they have cancer. Because of what I just described sounds extraordinarily scary. The risk of these complications is low. Um, but they exist in a real way. So in my non-cancer, non-diverticular patients, the risk of complication after surgery is not zero, but dude, close, <laughs> you know, like those patients do great. If you've got diverticulitis, mm, you're starting out with an infection. Those patients are more prone to getting infections and maybe hernias. Every now and then, their little hookup won't heal. That's much less than 1%. Whereas if you've had radiation, you're looking at a 15 to 20% chance of an anastomotic issue in the face of radiation. As a surgeon, this is one of the reasons that we will do a protective ostomy. And, um, and this could be a very long com conversation. I apologize. I'm trying to cram it into 30 minutes. It's not working. Um, some of the long-term implications of surgery can include recurrence of your cancer, right? It's why we do such an aggressive surgery to minimize this recurrence. Typically when reoccurrence re occurs, it happens outside of the colon as a metastatic phenomenon. As a surgeon, I'll go back in a year later to grade my homework. Anytime you have a weird 
GI complaint, I'll go in with a colonoscopy. I talked to a patient the other day who had a colon cancer surgery, not by me, by someone else a year ago. They did an awesome job, follow-up colonoscopy, looks perfect. Unfortunately, this patient has evidence of reoccurrence outside of the colon. So that's the number one place where their reoccurrence will happen. Um, some of the things that can happen after surgery are diarrhea, especially if you had a right-sided colon cancer because the right side of the colon is responsible for absorbing water. If you've had a right-sided colon resection, you can deploy something called Fibrocon or, or, or compressed psyllium. Dry psyllium tablet, take a couple of those once or twice a day. That tends to help. And, and even Imodium, once someone's ruled out, there's no recurrent cancer, you don't have colitis, then Fibrocon and Imodium are on the docket of things that you can do for that complication. Um, one of the, and I misspell constipation. Lord have mercy, doctor. Um, and magnesium. That is interesting. The N in my constipation is sitting at the end of the N. <laughs> You can tell I do these things by myself with no help. <laughs> anyway, don't look at the PDF file. All right, that's all I'm going to suggest. <laughs> don't look at my slides. But I misspelled a few things. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so constipation, super common, especially if you've had a rectal tumor that we've worked on. The rectum is a very special part of the colon. It has uh, distension capabilities. It helps store poop for periods of time, and then it coordinates a contraction to help you empty the rectum so you can poop. You put scar there and anastomosis there. You compress the volume of the rectum. Now you might have constipation. You might have to poop four times in a row every morning. We call that low anterior resection syndrome, where the patient doesn't just kind of wake up, drink their coffee, and go poop. They have what we call cluster bowel movements where they have to poop multiple times per day. Uh, usually boom, 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 right uh, together. It's very, very annoying. It happens to most people, especially if you've been radiated. And the lower you go, the more likely that is to occur. Now, there's some surgical techniques we can do to try to avoid that. But there's really, you only God can make a rectum. I, what can I tell you? Only God can make a sphincter and only God can make a rectum. And while surgeons might think we're God, so well, we're not. Um, so we have these cool surgeries that can remove the tumor and save your life. But it comes with certain annoyances and certain complications. And, and that one is one of them. If you've got LAR syndrome, and I've had several people ask me that, um, that's a muscle spasm. So take a muscle relaxant. You can do warm tap water enemas. This sounds weird. Just like you would gargle mouthwash in the morning, maybe. Um, after you use the restroom, squirt some warm water in your rectum and try to get everything out of there. That way you're not making multiple trips to the bathroom. That's an easy trick. Anyone who's ever had cancer, who has a bowel habit issue, should always make sure as a first objective you do not have reoccurrent cancer as the cause for your symptoms. Okay, so don't be doing anything that I'm telling you without going to see your oncology, your surgeon, and the oncologist. Now, stoma, this is the big um, hullabaloo. Nobody wants a stoma. In some patients, it'll be temporary, as I said. If we're doing, if you've had radiation, you have a rectal cancer. And I do a surgery called a low anterior resection. I'm pretty much going to give you a temporary ileostomy. Not always, but if you've had radiation, yeah, yeah, pretty much always. That is a protective thing. I want you to think of that as crutches. You are not to have that stoma for a prolonged period of time. Just long enough to heal. The rectum radiated tissue is slow to heal. You will have the stoma for three months, most likely. Sometimes the stoma is permanent and it depends on the location of the tumor. Um, a lot of times it's not required. A right-sided colon uh, cancer is not going to require a colostomy. A sigmoid colon cancer is often not going to require a colostomy. If you're faced with either a temporary or permanent colostomy, I highly suggest a, a website called ostomy.org. It's the American Ostomates Association, and they've got personalized support. I mean, like people who've been through this, you can contact 
who can kind of talk you down off the ledge and it's going to be okay. And trust me, um, you don't want to have the consequences of an unresectable cancer because you refused intervention. Um, let's cure your cancer so you can spend your life with your family without discomfort. And sometimes the most comfortable way to live is not by hooking everything together. Sometimes the most comfortable way to live is with a stoma. And there are a lot of people with them. Uh, in Texas, the example I use is a woman called Babe Saharius. If you know the name, she was an Olympic athlete who won, I think, the pent pentathlon. And um, she developed rectal cancer at a very young age, had to have a permanent colostomy, obviously couldn't do pentathlete stuff. And she took up golf, natural athlete, and became one of the first female professional golfers. There's a little um, Hall of Fame kind of museum dedicated to her between New Orleans and Houston is the main reason I know they have it. There's a statue of like someone throwing a javelin, but, but right. So that's one of the early examples of, okay, as a professional athlete with a colostomy cancer survivor. So it's not the end of the world. If you need it, it's not your favorite. I get it, but you might want to talk to these people um, because you know, the stoma is just a different way of living, but you've got family, you've got children, you've got a life to live, a purpose to serve. And so one of the reasons that I'm giving this lecture is to tell you what to expect if you get a diagnosis of cancer, share this with friends if they have that diagnosis. And then more importantly, the next part of this conversation is follow up and how I want you to kind of go into thrive mode. Once you get through all this scary stuff, there's going to be tests. They're going to do all kinds of x-rays and stuff, blood work, lots of tests. Yeah, you betcha. The survival rate is high for early stage cancers. Once you get stage four cancer, the survival rate precipitously drops off. This is why we push colon cancer screening. This is why we tell you if someone says you've got stage three cancer, you need chemotherapy, do the chemotherapy. Your survival 72% you refuse the chemotherapy and then present as a stage four months later, your survival rate drops. And so the sooner you get diagnosed, the more you intervene, the more likely you're going to survive. Okay. What not to do? Refuse a colonoscopy because you don't want to do a colonoscopy. Those doctors don't know what they're talking about. You're scared of the answer. I've had patients know there's something wrong with them and have not wanted the colonoscopy because they didn't want to hear the news. Well, every day that you delay, you're running the risk of getting stage four cancer. I would rather find a stage three than a stage four. Don't ignore your doctors. I get it. The last four years, certain very publicly placed physicians have ruined the reputation of almost every other doctor on the planet by giving advice that was unsound and that did not follow actual standard of care. I understand. Um, it's been very frustrating to watch. It's one of the reasons I am... Uh, driven to do my social media stuff. And it's also probably why <laughs> my voice gets kind of suppressed in social media because I'm highly critical of that. Patients used to trust us and now they don't. And I have seen patients develop cancer under the nose of doctors because they don't trust the doctors. They don't trust the pharmacy company that makes the chemotherapy and they don't trust the oncologist. That is heartbreaking to me because especially if you have a rectal cancer. There's no pain like rectal cancer pain. Please, please, please don't do this. Um, don't refuse treatment. You can add good health and I'll explain that, but do not try to replace an operation or chemotherapy with the naturopathic way of things. Because while some people will seemingly do okay with the naturopathic it's never been studied. I can't tell you what the percentage is. I can't tell you what the outcomes are. We don't have databases. You need to follow the standard of care. And then if you want to add a nutritional regimen, I'm about to explain that to you. Yeah, I'm with you. Add the nutritional regimen. Cancer steals nutrition from you. This is how I get into the nutritional realm in the first place. First of all, you have got to eat a gluten-free diet. I don't care that it sounds not fun. I don't care like, oh, it's impossible. What am I going to eat? There's so many things that don't have gluten in them. 
That is a ridiculous argument, especially in the modern era. I am telling you right now, evidence is coming out that inflammation of your intestinal tract sets up decades before your cancer does. I advocate everyone at any age to be on a gluten-free diet to prevent human disease. And I believe it will bear out that colon cancer is not going to be due to red meat and it's not going to be due to anything other than most likely anything that causes intestinal inflammation. Everyone's a little bit different, but everyone responds negatively to gluten wheat, whether you like it or not, and whether you think you do or not. The way wheat is grown in the modern era causes inflammation. So if you eat very little wheat that you know how it's grown without fertilizers, you might be able to get away with a special treat once a month, every other week. But to have a sandwich every single day with gluten, um, you're impeding your healing process when it comes to surgery and you're probably inciting uh, medical illness uh, long term. Okay, so be cognizant. You do you. But I'm just, this is my advice. And I study this daily. That's what I'm doing all the time is reading papers on this particular, <laughs> this particular topic, eat lots of protein. And I'm talking one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass, which is typically 70 to 80% of your overall weight. If you're a man, it's probably 80 to 90% of your overall weight, depending on your body habitus. Okay. So if you'll just take your weight, uh, times 0.8. That's how many grams of protein at a minimum you need under stress and healing a surgery. You might need as much as two grams per lean body weight. So protein, this can be difficult if you're partially obstructed. This is how I came to meet the guy who makes the egg whites international that everyone gave me. <laughs> Like, oh, that sounds so gross. This is a liquid egg white sterile solution. It's pure protein, very easy to absorb. And that this is the exact patient who needs something like that. Any way that you get your protein is good. If you are a plant-based patient, this is very difficult because there's so much fiber in plant-based protein and the colon in the presence of a lot of fiber um, can struggle to digest that. Um, get a powdered plant-based protein supplement if that is the if that's you. Um, and or if you're not religiously opposed to eggs, consider this egg white supplement. Um, stay active. You have to have purpose. Human beings need a purpose-driven life. And so find it if family, children, grandchildren, big events charitable or otherwise pick up a cause pick up your cross grab it and and walk with it okay so this is you have to have a purpose driven life and um okay so the more that you prioritize your family and your faith the easier it is for you to to overcome this type of medical illness um a lot of my patients continue to work and i highly suggest it i'm not saying 60 hours a week you know, if you're, if, if my cancer comes back and it's been 20 years, knock on wood, maybe 20, my husband's probably listening to this. Don't worry, baby. I don't think about this a lot, but, um, it's been 24 years. It's known to reoccur 20 to 30 years after you got it. It's a melanoma. If it ever comes back, the amount of work I'm doing is going to be limited. I'll probably limit it to this. Um, but you have to have a purpose-driven life. Otherwise, you know, the wheels fall off too, too much. Now there are additive therapies and I believe in these additive therapies. There's an oncology group in New York that will add light therapy and sound therapy. In particular, green light is healing. Red light is healing for inflammatory issues, but green light helps heal wounds. Green light. Okay. And then sound therapy what was at 528. Does that sound right? Some of you sound therapy people will know that the actual hurts. But so it's th the Tibetan bowls. Meditate Tibetan bowls. Okay. <laughs> Green light. Do it. These things will all actually help. As crazy as they may sound, there is science 
behind it. Laughter is some of the best medicine. It's why I have a sense of humor. And then you have to have sleep. You cannot heal if you're not sleeping. And here's a situation when you're under stress, it's extraordinarily difficult to sleep. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things you can add. Again, the sponsors of our little show here have a, an, a supplement for sleeping, one for stress and not a supplement with medicine, but a patch. Okay. Some of the supplements that you can take by mouth will be an alkaline diet. Your body's acidic. Cancers grow very rapidly. They could care less. They pollute your system. They make you live in an acidic environment. So an alkaline diet. There are some chelating detox diets. I'm not going to go into what they are. Liver support is extremely helpful. Chemotherapy has to be cleared out of your system by your liver. So you want to kill cancer cells, but your body's got to keep up with that. So you don't kill yourself. You got to have protein. You got to have liver support. You need to be oxygenated. One of the reasons I believe in ozonation of water or even oil um, to consume is to get oxygen directly to the system, especially wounds that are trying to heal. Hyperbaric oxygen cannot be used in the presence of metastatic disease um, and should not be used orally if the cancer has not been resected. You don't want to feed the cancer oxygen. You want to starve the cancer of oxygen. If you're cleared of your cancer, there's no evidence of cancer whatsoever, then absolutely I want you engaging in oxygen related things because it'll help you heal. There's something called N-acetylcysteine, um, which I firmly believe in. The only paper I've ever seen, ironically enough, that shows you maybe, I don't know, you shouldn't use in acetylcysteine or in patients with melanoma. And I personally have had a melanoma and yet there I am. <laughs> I, I take it every day. Um, melanoma has not returned. So I guess in my instance, it, I wouldn't do it. If you've had a melanoma, be cautious. That's the one paper I have read where there's like mixed evidence, everything else. If the cancer is gone in particular, when you're going through chemotherapy, go for it. Um, THC. Well, that is, and I'm probably can't say that word out loud in a social media platform. My, my last name is Toker. I've never engaged in any of these medications, but I am one of the very few licensed physicians to give compassionate care THC prescriptions to patients with cancer, because I do firmly believe that it helps them. Uh, it's one of the many oddities about me. Um, and so uh, what I think is an awesome additive with no medicine and you can do in the presence of cancer and you can do during your treatments and your chemotherapy are going to be these non-medicated patches. This is the super patch situation that I am talking about. Stress will keep you from sleeping, will keep you from healing, will depress your immune system, which means the cancer will get its upper hand. You need an intact immune system to fight cancer. So super patch has several patches that can help you. This technology, there is no medicine. You are not going to put it on your skin and feel anything. It is a texture that your brain recognizes. It allows your skin to send a specific signal to your brain to bring the brain back into homeostasis. The three that I suggest around any surgical process is a liberty because that helps bring the vagus nerve, which controls your intestinal tract, back into line. This can also help with your balance and chemotherapy can throw off your balance through peripheral neuropathy. So I believe in the Liberty patch for that. Peace is awesome for stress and stress kills people and defend helps with the immune system. Again, it does not fix things. It does not replace things. It does not cure things. Your poor brain is being assaulted with chemotherapy and cancer and metastases and malnutrition. This is something that you can do to help your brain figure all of that out. And it does so without medicine, without negatively impacting the other treatments um, and can sort of support you while you're going through this process. I sit on their medical board. I firmly believe in this. I'm engaged in some of the research um, that is bearing out that this is an amazing supportive for human beings during the course of illness. Um, there are stem cell supplements that you can take um, orally 
that support stem cell release. I don't know what to tell you about that with an active cancer in place. So I won't say while you still have cancer in place to deploy that, but in the post-operative period, when you're healing and there's no evidence of cancer, I think it would be a good additive to support the healing process. The microbiome is critical to health and it is a disruptive microbiome that likely led to your cancer in the first place. I do highly suggest digestive supplements, enzymes, digestive bitters to coordinate digestion, probiotics, prebiotics, and in particular, stay away from gluten. That is critical, critical, critical. My prevent, and I talked too long again today, I apologize. <laughs> Get screened before you have any symptoms right? Start when they say to start. Get the colonoscopy, okay? You can remove a precancerous polyp with a colonoscopy and prevent a cancer. It has been sh scientifically shown in studies, people who get routine colonoscopies are less likely to be diagnosed with an actual cancer, okay? And so get screened. Anyone with a symptom needs to be evaluated for cancer no matter what their age. I have seen cancers in very, very young people. So if you come into my office with hemorrhoids, you've got one month to let diet, non-medical, you know, non-surgical intervention make you better. Because otherwise you're getting a colonoscopy to prove you don't have a cancer or polyp or some other issue before I do surgery. And that's not, those doctors just want to make money. Okay. I make $135 on a colonoscopy for Medicare. Right. So I don't make any money doing a colonoscopy. That's not why we do it. We're trying to prevent a colon cancer. Okay. Now what the hospital charges is a different issue, but a lot of people and politicians have been so successful in blaming doctors for the cost of medicine and doctors are not the cause of your medical care. We do not get reimbursed to write a prescription. We do not get reimbursed for many of our procedures at a rate we used to. When I started my practice, I got paid five times more for colonoscopy than I do right now. So don't blame your doctor when they offer you the colonoscopy. They're not fishing for a car payment. What they're saying is cancer is happening at an alarming rate in younger people. I, we miss cancers in young people because of this. So don't mess around with weird symptoms. You got to have the colonoscopy to prove you don't have a cancer or some other illness before moving forward. You can try the holistic route for about six weeks. And if your symptoms have not gotten better, I'm sorry, you need to have a full workup because of the hour I just spent talking to you about what happens if a cancer gets missed. Okay. Man, did I scare you enough? I didn't mean to. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So you can go to my website to find these PDF slides, uh, drannatoker.com. We put most of these PDFs in, under the services tab. If you go to the shop area, you'll see our sponsors, including Super Patch. Um, and, and, and I love their product. Please give me feedback on that. Some patients have contacted me to ask questions. I'm free to answer those questions. And um, I hope to see you guys next week. I think next week we talk about the microbiome. That'll be an interesting one. Uh, tune in on Spotify and take a look on YouTube where we um, also post all these videos. All right. We'll talk to you guys soon.